Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Danuta Wasserman and I am professor in psychiatry at Karolinska Institute, which awards the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine each year in Stockholm, Sweden. I am also director of the National Center for Suicide Research and Prevention of Mental Health Problems and the director of the WHO Collaborating Center. My lecture comprises three parts. The first part will be about the epidemiology of suicidal behaviors and the theoretical model for suicidal behaviors. The second part will be about evidence-based suicide preventive methods from the healthcare perspective and the third part suicide preventive methods from the public mental health perspective. And by the end I will also say something about suicide prevention during COVID-19 pandemic. At our institution, we work with epidemiological surveillance of trends around the world, trends in suicide, with research, education, and development of preventive methods. We have many funds from European Union on monitoring suicidal behavior, but also working with the preventive programs um, in uh, prevention of depression whose persons with somatic diseases. We have also a basic research and I will give you some results from this research later on. The World Health Organization has a data bank on mortality which has grown from 33 member states in 1950s to more than 130 member states today. And there is an approximation that 8,000 people die by suicide in the world each year. Of course, this number are strongly underestimated due to different monitoring and registration methods, as well as to cultural biases. We know that in many countries suicide is still taboo and in a few countries forbidden. Globally, suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people, usually after death in traffic accidents or tumors. It is approximately calculated that 20 people attempt suicide in relation to each completed suicide. And this is true for young people, but not for elderly. In elderly, the ratio is one to one, which means that we must very eagerly investigate and treat and follow up elderly people the annual suicide rate in the world is approximately 10 persons per 100,000 world population, higher for males, for almost 14, and lower for females. And we can see this relation in all six regions of WHO. By the end of this video, I will show you without any comments, PowerPoints for all those six regions and each individual country, which means that you will have a chance to see where your country is located in those tables. If we calculate that it is 800,000 to 1 million suicides per year in the world, we can see that in every 40 seconds there is one death due to suicide, which is a horrible number. And suicide causes 57% of all violent deaths 
when we calculate deaths due to suicide, ward and homicide together. When occurs suicide? Suicide occurs where it is in balance between protective factors and risk factors. In the state of good mental health, there is equilibrium between risk and protective factors. And WHO is using this model for preventive activities, which we call social ecological model, because suicide must be prevented on several levels of level of individual, family, community and society. To the risk factors on the society level, we can count economic and social inequalities, unemployment, poor accessibility to the healthcare services. On the individual level, we speak about major depressive disorder, about psychotic disorders, alcohol and drug misuse or abuse, etc. And we have also on the relationships level that suicidal people are very lonely, so loneliness is a big problem, even lonely in their own families because they are poor communicators and cannot seek help as well as other people. Protective factors is of course good access to the healthcare, good access to the community services, family support for treatment to give good support so patients comply to treatment which is prescribed, the sense of self-worth on the individual level and the sense of that one is connecting to friends, neighbors or peers in, the, in school or in the working places. We will shortly look at the theoretical model behind the suicidal behaviors. This model is called stress vulnerability model and takes into consideration gene and environment interactions and also the acquired and inherited vulnerability, which sometimes is called diathesis. According to this model, if we have stressful life events, which are hitting vulnerable individuals with diathesis prone to suicidal behavior, those people start to get imbalance between protective and risk factors. And stresses can be of different kind. It can be unemployment, it can be family problems, uh, discord in the family, etc. We know also that the role of environmental factors and genetic factors is 50-50. And there are many genetic studies showing that there are different reactions to stress in males and females. My group, which studies suicidal behaviors in relation to the genetic makeup of the individual, in interrelation with stress and personality showed that males are much more prone to act with suicidal behaviors to already very low levels of stress in comparison with females. So maybe it can be one of the explanations why the rates for males in the world rates of suicide are much higher than female rates. So my group also defined 40 suicide behavior specific genes. This work is in press in European Journal of Neuropsychopharmacology. And this is in line with the previous epidemiological psychiatric studies showing that suicidality is inherited independently from psychiatric disorders, which means that 
patients who have psychiatric disorders, not of the, all of them are suicidal, and we know it from the practice. Only some of them which have this genetic makeup, and there will be certainly many more than 40 of those suicides behavior specific genes, and in interrelation with stress or other environmental factors, they react with suicidal behaviors. Those genes we identified now are major neurodevelopmental genes and uh, with regard to the gene-environment interactions and epigenetic effects during childhood. Those 40 suicidal behavior genes which are identified now, we can compare with 3,900 genes which are already identified today for psychiatric disorders. Coming back to stress vulnerability model, it, it contains also the development of the suicidal process from suicidal ideation, communication, suicide attempts, and completed suicide. It is important to study this process because the interplay between suicidal communication from the suicidal person and the family and the staff, care workers, is very important. What I mean by that is that the answer from the key persons, I mean answer from the family, answer from the care staff, to the suicidal communication can save the life of the suicidal person, or it can be detrimental. We not so seldom react to the suicidal communication with silence or ambivalence due to the lack of knowledge, because we don't know how to answer when somebody is communicating that I think that I am going to kill myself. Those communications can be performed in different forms, verbal, uh, non-verbal, direct and non-direct. And it can be very strange interplay between the suicidal person who seeks help and the family member or uh, staff from psychiatric hospital who is maybe silent or ambivalent. I speak here about the mechanisms of transference and counter-transference in the relation between doctor and suicidal patient. And we all need to be aware that suicidal communication evokes, even in professionals, very strong feelings of emotional feelings because we choose our profession to save lives. And here we are confronted with an individual who doesn't want to live any longer. Now I will speak about prevention and evidence-based preventive methods. From the health care perspective, it is very well known that antidepressant drugs Lithium treatment, neuroleptics, psychotherapy and psychosocial measures have evidence for significantly decreasing suicide and other suicidal behaviors. Concerning antidepressants, we know that we need to use antidepressants with tranquilizing effect because many suicidal patients have quite big anxiety and the anxiety is the motor for this development of the suicidal process I spoke about into attempted suicide or completed suicide. Therefore, it is important to combine antidepressants with anxiolytics it is also important to combine antidepressants with psychotherapy or active follow-up of treatment in order to detect this anxiety. We know that in the beginning of the treatment with antidepressants, it can be increase of anxiety, 
which can drive the suicidal process. And we know also when antidepressants are active in the treatment, the psychomotor inhibition stops, but anxiety and many other problems still remain and the person is still in suicidal situation. So therefore, follow active up the treatment you prescribed. They are very nice studies since long time ago about the outcomes in suicide uh, and attempted suicide for patients which are bipolar when treated with lithium or without lithium. We can see that it is almost five times less, less suicides in the group treated with lithium and 10 times less of suicide attempt in the group treated with lithium. But we need to perform this treatment for at least two years. So they are not short-term effects, they are long-term effects. When we treat schizophrenia, especially chronic schizophrenia, there are studies showing that suicide can de decrease by 75% as well there is a decrease of suicide attempts. Psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy and other psychotherapies, they reduce suicide attempts and they reduce repetition of suicide attempts. Dialectical behavior therapy is especially active for females with borderline personality. Continuity and follow-up of suicide attempters is a very important problem. And in our monitoring studies from Europe, we could see that continuity of treatment for suicide attempter is very, very poor. A suicide attempter can have up to 20 contacts with at least five treatment providing facilities. And is it a good treatment? It is not possible for those different doctors or psychologists really to know well patients. It, therefore, it is very important to have a continuous follow-up. WHO many, many years ago had a suicide preventive project which I conducted with them in five countries on different continents. And we had a treatment as usual group, which was a control group, and treatment as usual with brief intervention contact, which was an intervention group. And in this group, which was intervention group, with brief intervention and contact, the doctor or psychologist had a one-hour individual information session after suicide attempt about reasons for suicide and possibilities for help and treatment before suicide attempter was discharged from the hospital. Then we had an independent person, which was a student or volunteer, which through phone calls or visits had nine follow-up contacts with the suicide attempter, one, two, four, seven, eleven weeks, and four, six, twelve, eighteen months, altogether nine contacts during an eighteen months follow-up. The results were amazing. Mortality by suicide decreased significantly from 18 in the control group, which was treatment as usual, to 2 in the, con in the intervention group, where we had treatment as usual and brief information and contact. Which means that we have low-cost brief intervention which can be used both in high, middle and low income countries. I am planning now, together with World Health Organization, 
with World Psychiatric Association and with Karolinska Institute, which contracted some sponsors for that study on hopefully all continents, uh, to describe partly responses concerning mental health indicators and suicide as an indicator of different nations to COVID-19 pandemic, but also to perform this treatment as usual in combination with brief intervention and contact follow-up, and to see if we can with digital methods, new way of following up suicide attempters, obtain the similar results as before. And we will have countries both from Latin America, United States is interested, they performed already a pilot study before, Europe, Africa and Asia. From the public health perspective, there are also several preventive methods. Restriction to access of lethal means of suicide is a very important method of preventing suicide. Control of pesticides, regulation of firearms, barriers at jumping sites and hotspots reducing hanging possibilities and legal points in hospitals and prisons, and reducing availability of medications, selling them over counter, over the counter in small packages or blisters, show significant decreases in suicidal behaviors. In one study which I performed many years ago in the former Soviet Union, during perestroika, perestroika means restructuring during the Gorbachev time, if you remember this time, we could see that suicide due to the sale of alcohol, they were alcohol restrictions on producing and selling alcohol, but they were also actively promoted changes in the attitudes towards using alcohol. We could see that suicide for men decreased by 32%, with comparison in Europe, 3%. Also, deaths from homicide and from violent causes due to external injuries decreased. And it was very interesting that suicides decreased in all 15 former Soviet republics both with low and high suicide rates, both for males and females, but most significantly for men. So it was a one natural experiment which shows that it is possible to decrease suicide among men. Media reporting is another measurement which is very important in suicide prevention. It is very important not glamorize, not romanticize suicidal behavior because it has impact on vulnerable individuals in psychiatric hospitals, prisons, indigenous reserves, that there can be a cluster of suicides due to inappropriate reporting by media. And they are guidelines from World Health Organization. They are also guidelines from American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. School prevention are also important because children are entire day in the school and in schools we can follow both somatic development and psychological development and also use some time for preventive intervention. Those which are evidence-based, it is described by David Brandt in Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry 2018, is the good behavior game from United States and use aware of mental health YAM from Karolinska Institute and Columbia University in New York. 
And in those interventions, we are using cognitive, emotional, and experiential learning methods. They are not long. Use aware of mental health is five hours intervention during several weeks in order to run it a little bit like a psychotherapeutic process. From this study, where the YAM, use aware of mental health intervention, was studied, study is called SAILI, Saving and Empowering Young Lives in Europe. We described in more than 50 papers different risk protective factors, the effects of intervention, and I would like to share with you the important protective factors for mental health and suicidal behavior where we could see a very strong association. Poor sleep, lack of physical activity, were risk factors associated with suicidal behavior. Reading books, unfortunately we are not reading so many books, especially young people today, but reading books was significantly associated with protection, uh, protective uh, behaviors against suicide. The same is concerning abstaining from alcohol use. So there was shortly overview of evidence-based suicide preventive strategies. And maybe now we can look what is going on during the COVID-19 and suicidal behaviors. I wrote a policy document for the World Psychiatric Association, which will be published on the World Psychiatric Association website. It was together with the suicidology section at World Psychiatric Association. And to, this document can be of help for you when speaking with politicians and decision makers, everybody knows that we face the uncertain future. Stress, some people have sleeping problems. Anxiety, depression and alcohol misuse is increasing. Existing mental disorders are deteriorating in spite of that we know that patients are not seeking help, or maybe because they are not seeking help, uh, because they are afraid, afraid of uh, coronavirus in the hospitals. We know also that treatment compliance can decrease, which says that we really need to have good follow-up of our patients with mental disorders and try to find digital means of contacting with them in order to increase compliance and in order to give them some hope and not to let them be, be in the situation of loneliness, loss and hopelessness. We know also that in some families relationships can improve but in others, the conflicts can arise as well as interpersonal violence and abuse. And we know that there is shortage of possibilities to seek help as usual in the community or in helplines because we have barriers to accessing healthcare and we have barriers to accessing help from the community. We know also that access to suicidal means increase because people are holding medications or firearms, which means that information about how to safely store medications and firearms and not allow children to come in contact with them is very important. The economic hardship will hit entire world in, to different degree in different countries, but still there will be people who are unemployed and who have very little money. And legislation concerning economical measures and healthcare 
there are big differences between countries, which means that we must be very innovative with new methods of following up and treating patients and people at risk in a cost-effective way. I would like to repeat what I said before, that public health, mental health approaches, they go hand in hand with healthcare approaches. So don't use only one approach, try to use both of them. And the description of all those approaches, one is in a book which was published in 2016, Suicide and Unnecessary Death, which is very easily written and can be read by uh, busy clinicians, by students, by public health workers. And Oxford Textbook of Suicidology and Suicide Prevention is a big book. It is a book like that. And this is a book for researchers. Uh, so it is a very good coverage of what research says up to today and what more can be done. And this book is in press and will be published by the end of 2020. Now, it will follow age standardized suicide rates for both sexes per 100,000 population on all continents. And it is a map from World Health Organization. You can find this map in the report from WHO, which was published 2019, Suicide in the World global health estimates and the following tables for each regions you can find in this report as well. Before I will show you on the film the data available, I would like to thank you very very much for listening to me and being with me on video. I hope soon in the future we will all be able to meet in person. Thank you.